Hello everyone and welcome to the ILX third virtual session that we're running for our clients. Uh, this is all about crisis management. Now one of the things that we're not going to be covering through this is building disaster recovery plans and looking at your risk matrix and mitigation points. What this WebEx will really focus on is what you need to do in the moment. The person you need to be, the kind of thoughts you need to have and the communication you need to have out with your team when a crisis happens. ILEX do an awful lot around disaster recovery and risk mitigation, so this is not part of formal project management planning. This is more about the psychology of what happens when a crisis occurs. To start off with, I'm just going to go through a couple of domestic points, i.e. what helps with a WebEx. Now, when you joined, you were all joined on mute. That's because we currently have, let's see, 153 people now that have um, logged on. If you didn't join on mute, the background noise and those little bing bings would be incredibly annoying. However, please feel free to unmute yourself if you can and ask a question if you want to. Probably the best place and way to ask a question is in the question box. I keep the question box open and live while I'm going, so if you see me glancing down and to the right, that's because I'm just checking your questions, and I will try and answer them as we go through. A little bit about me, I love questions. When we do formal training events in a face-to-face -face environment, I get a big pen that can write on Windows, and I, get, uh, and I write on it, there is no such thing as a stupid question in training. So ask anything at any time. In addition, what I recommend you do is make notes as we go through. Some of the points that we cover will be new to you. Some of them won't be new, but they'll still be valuable to be reiterated or have a spotlight on them. In addition, on Friday, what we will do at ILX is send you out an email with a one page summary that shows the four main frameworks that we're using and the additional two methodologies and tools. So you will get a summary of this. However, it's not a capture of the entire WebEx, so please do make notes on anything you want to. Also remember ILX has a YouTube video channel and these presentations are put live on that channel within a few days. So you can always go back and have a look at the 60 minute session as well. As a final thought, Although we're due to finish at 5 p.m. UK time, I always hang around and I'm always happy to answer more questions at the end of the session as well. So if there's something that you want to ask that's perhaps a little bit more private, feel free to hold on to the end of the session and maybe put in your question five minutes after we finish and I'll be happy to try and answer it as we go through. Let's have a look at the quick agenda for what we're covering through. We will be exploring today, first of all, stopping thinking and acting and why that is so difficult to do in a crisis. I'm going to share with you some of the psychology that happens and some of the things that you can do, some lovely frameworks to help you stop, think and act. We're also going to be looking at good leadership traits for when you are in a crisis, how you need to lead and manage your people or even if you're not a, a formal leader, how you can inspire the people around you. We're going to be looking at, and this is where the, probably the main bulk will be, prioritizing, preparation, and how to actually decide what you should be doing. Now, that's the main bulk of what we're looking at. And in essence, as I put in the brackets there, it's what to actually do in a crisis. And finally, our last few minutes, we'll be looking at how you can empower and delegate tasks to others in a way that makes sure that they have a clear idea of what needs to be happening and you are comfortable that they have a clear idea of what needs to be happening as well. Now, before we begin, before we dive straight into the how we manage a crisis, we need to explore the different types of crisis that can occur. And in particular, we're going to play with two ideas, the idea of a fast crisis and slow crisis. A slow crisis is something that creeps up on you. Now, often many people can see it coming and they shout about it, but the majority start to ignore it. And here's the thing with slow crises. They can absolutely devastate an organization or a team, or in fact, even go further than that. Now, some of you may have seen the video link we sent out to Leonard Gerd's um, The Future is Change, and that you are at the heart of change. 
And even without something like COVID-19, we find within business, ongoing change can represent what we call a slow crisis. It's slow, it's slow, it's slow, until it gets to the point where it's not slow anymore. Now, I mentioned there's even more extreme cases than this. Um, I love history, I love physics, I love psychology. Recently, there's been documented uh, a case of a new site in China called Langshao. It's about 5,200 years old. It's probably one of our earliest advanced civilizations. So this place was around at the same time as Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt. And not when Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt were in their high heyday, you know, building the giant pyramids, but when they were still birthing civilizations. Langshao had amazing engineering skills. Its populace built a system of reservoirs and dams that held back 6.2 billion cubic meters of water. And the civilization existed for just under a thousand years before ultimately dying. About 1,700 years later, by the way, we start to get the birth of what we think of as ancient China that then leads to our more modern China as well. So what killed it? Well, this place was a specialist in irrigation, damming. In fact, one of the oldest dams that is around 5,200 years old is still in use today. That's how good the engineering was. What killed it? Flooding. You see, what happened was the water table rose. And each year, bit by bit by bit, it became harder to maintain those dams and therefore to maintain the fields and the food supply. And I can just imagine the people of Langshao thinking, oh, well, this is just, you know, a freak event. This is just something that's happening. Next year will be better. Beware of a slow crisis, because a slow crisis can wipe out a civilization. What about a fast crisis? Uh, how do we spell that city? A good, I'm pleased that you asked. L-I-A-N-G-Z-H-U. If anyone would like to correct me on my pronunciation, I will not fight with them at all. If anyone wants to find out more, there's some excellent articles in uh, the New Scientist magazine as of 21st of March. That's where I got my information from. There you go, a nice little further exploration point for you. Fast crises. These are emergencies that are thrust upon you. And of course, these are the ones that we are more familiar with. Maybe it's that IT problem. Maybe you've just been hacked. Maybe you're being held to ransom. Maybe someone has simply not plugged something in, but it means there's an absolute crisis as you are unable to do your core function in your job. Or maybe, it's a physical emergency, an earthquake, a fire, your factory's burned down, your logistics have gone to pot, and all of a sudden, we are in a crisis situation. Or maybe it's something even darker than that, such as a horrible little virus that keeps re-engineering itself, re-editing itself, and is causing us to go into lockdown in order to protect lives. So. Coronavirus and lockdown, was that a slow virus? Was that a slow crisis or a fast crisis? Well, a lot of that depends on your point of view. For example, in March 2020, Donald Trump explained that no one could have seen this coming. However, five years, seven months ago, one Mr. Obama, when talking to the National Institute of Health in Maryland in the United States, explained that actually, um, we need to be prepared for something exactly like this. Now, I will make it absolutely clear here, this is not a political statement. This is not about one party being right or even one person being right. This is the norm with us humans. In almost any situation, some people see these things coming and some people don't. And the whole thing can be swapped around again as well. So here's our first little lesson. Right now, in your organization, there are probably people saying, hey, we need to be paying attention to, and then there'll be something going on. Try not to bury your head in the sand. It's very easy to do. We don't like thinking about worst case scenarios. It's not in our human nature. But having a good disaster recovery plan, having some good crisis management and risk mitigation plans can be a real lifesaver or business saver in certain situations. 
to explore why a crisis can be so hard to manage, the first thing we need to know is what happens to us when crises strike? Because often it's only when they strike we realize we need a plan. Now that's going to bring me to uh, what may seem like a little bit of a tangent. It's why people get lost in the woods. Every year across Canada, hundreds of people get lost in the woods. Now, if you live in Canada, let's say you live in a lovely place like Nova Scotia, and I think we had a couple of people on from Canada, which is cool, uh, then you are probably more aware of your woodcraft and survival craft than than perhaps us uh, British, for example, or typical New Yorkers. Doesn't mean to say you're experts, but at least we have some awareness of it. One psychologist, a gentleman called Kenneth Hill from Nova Scotia, investigated 800 cases of people being lost in the woods in Nova Scotia. Of those cases, about 25% of the adults died. And he wanted to know what was affecting the death rate and what was affecting how people get found. Here's what happens when you get lost in the woods. You panic. And the trouble is when we panic, we start to make really bad decisions. And bad decisions lead to bad outcomes. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, I am not an expert on survival. So far from it. But I did do a little bit of reading up on this. Here's what you do if you get lost in the woods. You stay still. Try and be visible. What you don't do is follow your enormous urge to carry on and find a way out because that's how you get lost even more. Now, there has been a lot of work done on this, definitely. Um, and what we can find in these situations is being able to keep a clear head is one of the keys. Uh, bear with me a second, everyone. Um, I am just going to quieten my dog. I'm doing a live broadcast to 211 people, and my dog has just started dreaming while he's in the room with me. So this, hopefully you're all going to take the funny side of this, definitely. I'm going to be away from my webcam for about three seconds so that you can't hear him barking in his sleep. Bless him, he's a cute little boy. Lovely. Oh, my poor little Labrador is now wondering why he's been woken up. <laughs> but there we go. Uh, miniature crisis, absolutely, but one easily averted, so that's not too bad, not, not too bad at all in the slightest. So if we know that this is what's happening when people are lost in the woods, that actually we have a big panic point and we react badly, we can borrow this kind of learning and take it in forward when we're looking at how we do actually manage a crisis. For example, one of the early pioneers of uh, desert exploration, one Ralph Bagenold, who explored the deserts in the 1940s, said, and I'm going to put on a particular 1940s British accent to do this, there is an overwhelming urge to do something, however don't, stop, eat, smoke a pipe for half an hour, and reason returns. Now, not recommending that you start smoking a pipe in order to deal with a crisis, but Ralph's whole thing was stop, pause, don't instantly react, because when we try and instantly react, that's when things start to go bad. So here is our first framework, the stop, think and act framework, and it is literally first step, stop. Second step, gather your information. Now, the next thing links in with the information, because how do you know you have the right information? In the world of misinformation and bad information, it's always good to check your information is actually accurate. OK, now you've stopped and you're starting to get a picture, maybe a data picture of what's really going on, what the impacts might be. The next step before you ever get to some solutions, decide your priorities. It's important to do that before you get to your solutions because this helps you decide on the right solutions. So there's the very first instant framework that I wanted to share with you. Stop, gather information, check your information is accurate and decide your priorities. If we do this, then we can start to create a situation room. 
And that's where we start to look at leadership attributes. Now, a lot of my work, I find myself telling people things that they already knew, but they were too busy to think about. And this is the same with the leadership traits for crisis management. Here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, you already know this. So I'm gonna put up on the screen what most people uh, re responded to as good leadership traits in a crisis, and you will already know these. In fact, actually, I'm gonna pause for about 10 seconds here and just let you think, what do you want your leaders to do in a crisis? What do you think you should do in a crisis? I'm just gonna leave that hanging for a few more seconds. Yeah, I'm sure you've got it. So one of the first things is honesty. We don't want to be told a lie. We don't want to be misled. And actually, although there can sometimes be a tendency to soften the blow, most people want honesty. And that honesty goes through to being open and clear about the priorities. Now, I do mean, oh, yeah, absolutely, David, take accountability and responsibility plus transparency. Lovely input there, definitely. This transparency includes all of your priorities. So let's say that one of your priorities is making sure people are safe. A second priority is looking after your customers and a third priority is keeping your CEO happy. Share that, there's no shame in that. If people suspect that you have a hidden priority, it affects trust. If you're open with your priorities, you can explain them. And that means people will trust you and therefore they're going to be more likely to engage with the plan that you've come up with or your situation room comes up with as well. We want to keep calm. We don't want to be a headless chicken, but equally we need to show that we're taking this seriously. So there's a balance that you can do here in terms of, okay, we do need to look at this, but I have faith that we will find our way through it. Linked in with that is balancing positivity with empathy. Uh, the person that says, hey, this is a great opportunity to change the world. COVID-19 is a blessing in disguise. It's going to cut air travel. It's going to make the world a better place. Will you tell that to someone who's just lost someone? So we want to ba balance positivity with empathy. And it is a balancing act, definitely. And that leads us to our last of the leadership traits. Personally, I think this is probably the most important. Show your belief in your people because they will be the greatest asset you have. And again, a statement such as, everyone, this is going to be tricky, but I absolutely believe in our team and our capability to survive it. That's a wonderful leadership statement. You need to mean it. You need to think it up here to make sure that as it communicates out, your face and your tone are believable. But these are the key traits for a leader in a crisis. And I bet there is nothing um, that you didn't see there. Irene shared, quote from Elar Noss, when people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our calm, not join in their chaos. That is a beautiful quote, Irene. Lovely, thank you very much. Now, in the situation room, when you are being an amazing leader, you still need to think about what you actually are going to do at the moment all we've covered through is the stopping and gathering data and making sure it's accurate and making sure you are the right person to lead these people so now we're going to look at two frameworks that will help you actually uh, explore and plan for almost any crisis situation now i've um, taken my work here from some really really great minds uh, particularly the Brookings Institute is where I'm going to be referencing. And one of the things the Brookings Institute like to talk about is how you can turn negatives into positives. Actually, any business crisis can lead to an opportunity if it's handled the right way. I'm just going to refer back to this idea of balancing positivity with empathy, though. I am seeing lots of opportunities at the moment with COVID-19 and lockdown. I'm also aware two people that have died. I wasn't deeply close to them, but they were acquaintances. One was my wife's high school mentor. Sometimes we need to get the timing right on these things. It's really good to look for the opportunity. It's really good to seize the positive. But try and make sure we balance that with empathy 
as well. So just before we go to our next few slides that look at these frameworks, always remember there is a human cost to almost any crisis, not just COVID-19, but anything that disrupts someone's work, anything that disrupts a client interaction, there is a human cost to this. Okay, what can we actually do about this? So I mentioned the Brookings Institute, quite an impressive think tank based in Washington, one of many think tanks based in Washington. There's their mission statement. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? I'm not going to read it out. I'm going to let you read it yourselves there. One of the things I quite like about the Brookings Institute is they pride themselves on being reasonably independent. And of course, many think tanks in Washington are either left wing or right wing or have this particular centrist policy. This is just about gathering evidence and looking at seeing what works. And what they did was start to explore four steps that can be an immediate reaction plan. By the way, these four steps can also act as a planning item as well. So let's explore the four steps that the Brookings Institute recommend as an immediate reaction plan to a crisis. Step one, study and analyze previous crises. Now, this may mean that you are looking at your own experience or the experience of your own organization. Perhaps you need to widen the net. Perhaps you need to look at organizations in other countries or other sectors. Have they experienced the same? Maybe this is where you speak to your disaster recovery or DOR people and have a look at what did they base their disaster recovery plans on? Were there particular incidences or items? With COVID-19, the biggest single relevant situation that we had was Spanish flu. Unfortunately, it isn't that informative because the world is very, very different than it was 100 years ago when Spanish flu swept across the world. However, looking at how COVID-19 works, it was that modeling that led to the reaction of, you know what, we need to do something about this, otherwise millions are going to die. So the general lockdown, whether you think it's right or wrong or, or, or whatever, is based on studying and analyzing previous crises, what worked and what didn't work in those situations. The second piece is to start using your imagination. And unfortunately, that means sometimes we need to go to a bit of a dark place. Okay, so what is the full impact likely to be of this crisis? What different elements will it affect? In these different scenarios, how will this play out if we're in lockdown for another three weeks? How will it play out if there's a resurgence, a second wave, which is incredibly likely, and actually we find ourselves going back into lockdown in five months time? What if we're still in a lockdown situation in 12 months time or 18 months time? Think the worst and you can start planning for it. But if you don't think of it, if we do the typical of, I know I'm not looking, I'm not listening, then we don't really stand a chance of being able to plan for it. The next thing that we want to do is assemble a powerful team. Now, every, every time I say this, I always think of Avengers Assemble. This is all about multifaceted teams, and this is where your diversity plans uh, really, really work. So Cooldip's just said, will the virus be eliminated if we kill the transmission? First answer I can give you, Cooldip, is I'm not a virologist or immunologist, so I'm the wrong person to answer that. My understanding is the virus won't be eliminated, but it will be absolutely contained if we manage the transmission. Again, though, I really need to put a proviso in. I'm, I'm not the right person to ask there. Probably someone else on this chat thread is actually. By the way, everyone, if your company has been working hard over the last two or three years to boost diversity and in particular inclusion, this is where you get the enormous payoff. Because in your situation room, you want different thoughts, different ideas. You want access to different ways of doing things, different approaches on life. This is where someone says, well, this won't work because of X. And you realized you had no idea of that because you are such a different person to them. One of the great strengths of diversity and inclusion is it builds robustness in crisis situations. If you haven't been looking at DNI, that's okay. The purpose of me here is not to lecture you about DNI. I'm just saying this is one of the great payoffs for all your hard work if you have been looking 
at DNI points as well. Once you've got that wonderful team assembled of hopefully lots of different people coming up with lots and lots of different ideas, then you can start to think about your communication strategy. Now notice, we still haven't come up with a final plan here. We haven't come up with an absolute solution, but actually your communication strategy needs to kick in even before you have a solution. You need to talk about what's going to be happening, what's likely to happen, and how you are approaching it. This gives your people confidence that you are at least on it, that you are doing something here, that you're focused on this as well. So that's our first four-step plan. It was created, again, not by myself, by the Brookings Institute. Study and analyze previous crises. See what you can learn from these situations. Imagine some of the worst scenarios, because then you can start to plan for them. Create a diverse team, ideally of technical experts, but the key element here is diverse. And then think about your general communication strategy. What do we want to start sharing and telling others? Once we've done the initial response points, then perhaps we can follow some of the other Brookings Institute advice and start looking at actually how we can turn a crisis into an opportunity. And this, I think, is where things start getting really good fun as well. The first thing we do to, defer, to turn a crisis into an opportunity is we need to define it very clearly. And if you've been trained in anything like SWOT or PESCAL analysis, this is where you're going to use those skills, trying to define which elements are going to affect you the most and actually which elements aren't going to affect you. Where you may have some strengths or particular weaknesses in this current situation where you might be affected on a political, an economic, a technological level. Define how the crisis is affecting you. Define how the crisis is affecting your people. Define how the crisis is affecting your client group. This is why at ILX we're offering these free virtual sessions. One of the strengths that we have is to be able to offer virtual training in these kind of situations. And one of the weaknesses that most of our clients have, despite their enormous strengths, is actually getting hold of some good, respectable training around these kind of subjects. Defining the crisis starts to help you think about where to go here. The next thing we want to do, particularly in a big crisis situation, is start to ask some pretty fundamental and difficult questions. Now, I'm going to share with you a wonderful tool that can help you do that. Maybe some of you have heard of Peter M. Senge, an amazing philosopher um, and an all-round intelligent guy who came up with the concept of systems thinking. And on the screen now in front of you is a lovely little image for a systems thinking iceberg. Let me talk you through it. The first thing that happens is we get an event, such as the COVID-19 and lockdown. Or maybe it's um, a technical issue that has closed your company, or maybe it's a large number of complaints that's damning your reputation. The key thing is it's a singular event and it's really easy to see. But actually what we can ask almost immediately is, is this a singular event or is it a pattern or a trend? And what Peter was saying is that second question, is this a pattern or a trend? Normally it sits below the surface. It's a little harder to see. It takes deliberate questioning and deliberate focus to start to identify this. Anyone in information technology will understand the difference between a single user error or issue and an ongoing pattern or trend. But what we may not think about is how to go deeper. This pattern or trend, are we getting lots of complaints? Is this situation happening again? If it is, is there an underlying structure or system or process that's making this happen? One of the reasons that many people predicted that something like COVID-19 would happen is by studying what has happened in the past and then exploring how the world is even more connected and how transmission mates would soar the next time a Spanish flu happened or occurred. The underlying structures here 
lend themselves to the transmission of diseases. Does that mean we should change those underlying structures? I don't know. That's what we start to explore with the next level of questioning. Is there an assumption, a philosophy, a way of looking at things, an underlying mental model, which is then leading to the underlying structure, which then leads to the pattern or trend, which ultimately ends up with the event that we have seen. Now, again, I don't want to pretend that I have answers to COVID-19. That's not what this is about. But in almost any crisis situation, you can look at the event. Is this part of a wider pattern? Is there an underlying structure that's causing this? Is there a mental model that approaches this? I'm going to put this into a slightly softer example. Um, sometimes we can see people really struggling at work because perhaps they are, for example, under-resourced. The event is that a deadline is missed, that a client is unhappy. The pattern or trend is that this keeps happening. The underlying structure is that we have a headcount and we can't go over that headcount. However, the mental model is that the headcount doesn't take into account sickness, absence, or churn. So and many people on this WebEx right now will be from learning and development or HR. I'm sure you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. And we often call this the efficiency illusion. In our Western society, there is a drive for maximum efficiency. However, when you reach peak efficiency, I mean, sorry, when you reach peak efficiency, there's no wiggle room. So as any good project manager knows, ideally we need a slight redundancy of resources to take in what we know will happen, but actually can't particularly plan for, that 10% spare capacity. Am I telling you that you should overstaff by 10%? No. What I'm telling you is that our mental models impact the underlying structures, such as resourcing levels or the ability of technology, which then impacts our patterns and trends and our events. Systems thinking iceberg. It's a beautiful model for thinking about really complex systems, such as large organizations, societies, or policies. If you're curious about this, by the way, this is a lovely one just to Google. And I can also tell you that the image that you're looking at right now is on the one page summary that we'll send out to you as well. So let's go back to our Brookings Institute steps for turning this into a positive situation, a crisis into a positive. We talked about defining the crisis. We've just explored the element of asking fundamental questions as well. What comes next? How do we reframe the problem? For this, we're gonna to turn to one of my personal heroes, a gentleman called Professor Daniel Kahneman, who has written a brilliant book called Fast and Slow Thinking. In it, he explores one of the techniques that he uses to allow people to see things that they can't normally see. It's called a pre-mortem technique. Now, in project management, we teach this particularly around risk management. Uh, it's about projecting yourself into the future and looking back to identify what went wrong. Here's how you can reframe a problem using the pre-mortem technique so that you can see how it can be turned into an opportunity. Whatever the issue, ask yourself or pretend that it's five years into the future and you say, wow, that event hurt, but in the long run, it was good because it led to dot, dot, dot. At the moment, right now, if I do that exercise, and I wanna make it very clear, I'm sharing a personal professional view here as well, I believe that COVID is likely to lead to greater equality and therefore diversity and inclusion across businesses. Uh, we know from our studies that one of the things that harms diversity and inclusion is working practices, the idea of presenteeism. Actually, if you allow more people to do homeworking, and we covered this, by the way, in our last virtual session when we looked at how to manage teams who are working virtually, productivity gets boosted, uh, mental health goes up and stress goes down. We also know, which isn't something we particularly covered last time, but we also know it boosts diversity and inclusion because it allows a more varied number of people and type of people to attend work and do jobs. 
Now, does that mean that I think COVID-19 and lockdown is wonderful because it's going to make the world a fairer place? No, not when there's lives that are not here anymore. However, we can look at almost any crisis and think in five years time, when we look back, let's say it was good because it led to, and then you will fill in the blanks that are relevant for your organization, situation, or company. Just again, remember, balance the timing on this. Don't go into your situation room with your people who are reeling and say, hey, everyone, this is a wonderful opportunity, because people aren't always up for that level of optimism just then. So we reframe the problem to start looking for positive opportunities. Once we've done that, we can start experimenting. And one of the biggest parts of experimenting is allowing people to fail. Right now, I'm quite sure lots of your organizations started immediately jumping onto virtual working. Some of them did uh, split working. I have uh, colleagues and clients in Germany where they didn't do um, full working from home. Instead, what they did was they uh, did half working from home. So they split the amount of people going into the office. Here's the thing. We don't know what the right way is yet. If people experiment with lots of opportunities and lots of solutions, then we will find the right ones. But in order to do that, we need to allow some failure. Uh, I'm a, a trainer at heart. I'm a facilitator, business psychologist. So I have an acronym uh, of FAIL, which is first attempt in learning. When you allow fails, you allow success. And if your organization right now has an attitude of failure is not permissible, then what you're really saying is innovation and improvement are not permissible either. So we define the crisis. We ask big questions. Do things need to change? Reframe the problem into a positive. OK, so when we get out the, the other side and we know that this actually has led to some benefits, what will those benefits be? And we allow people to experiment and give permission to fail. When we've done all that, then we can start to manage the narrative. Then we can start to think about our communication models again. Yep, absolutely, David. You've done a couple of great comments. Thank you, David. Much appreciated. So failing forward and failing fast to learn and pivot. Absolutely. You know, it, um, there's a number of people who've made a lot of money out of that kind of philosophy and teaching that kind of philosophy. And the reason is it's true. It's absolutely true as well. Okay, let's look at how we might manage the narrative because this is quite a delicate thing. Uh, I'm going to share with you one of the models that we'll be looking at in our next session. Next Tuesday, we're looking at leading change. And next Tuesday, what I'm going to be doing is going through some of the traditional models, you know, the transition curve, and also some of the more advanced and deeper psychology that lets you skip the transition curve. For example, how to engage people and bring them on board with a change so they don't really go through that transition curve. Here's a quick glimpse at one of the models we'll be playing with next week. In this model, one of the first things we do is build a little bit of empathy. Mirror the person that you're talking to in terms of their emotional state, issue, or fear. Anyone watching uh, some of the leaders at the moment, I think Boris Johnson is a good example of this. You'll see him doing this in his speeches. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it at all, Boris recently returned to work. And, and what I'm about to show you, and I wrote this before he said it, pretty much mirrors his opening speech outside number 10 Downing Street. That guy has some really good speech writers. So you mirror the emotion, i.e. this hurts. Then you talk about the event that changed your mind. So the situation, the realization, the occurrence that helped you see that actually there was another way of doing things. There was a different thing to focus on. There was a new idea. And then you move the other person's emotion by showing how you have moved. For example, by demonstrating how the new way is working for you. Don't lose sight of those old emotions. We don't just abandon them. We talk about how we're still worried or unsure of something, but how actually the new model is working. 
Now, until recently, when teaching these kind of things, I'd be talking about IT changes, organizational changes after mergers and acquisitions, or maybe cultural changes, such as embedding a coaching culture, introducing appraisal systems, or one of my favorites, introducing diversity and inclusion as a key agenda item at a board level. One of the things that we're doing here, uh, so I'll give a, a quick uh, example of this, might be, so hey everyone, um, you all know that we're getting a new IT system. Now, I don't know about you, I hate it when we get new IT systems, it fills me with fear. I know the current one, I'm familiar with the current one, I do not like changing IT systems. So there you've seen how I've mirrored the potential negativity in my target population. What I would say is, um, I was trying to talk to a client the other day, and actually our current IT system, it just fell over. And uh, one of our IT people showed me the new system, I was very, very trepidatious over it, I was worried about it, but ultimately it worked. Um, I'm not going to say that I'm fully converted because it's a new system and I'm a human being, but I would say actually I am starting to see some of the big improvements that this new system can offer us. So what I would say is uh, don't be afraid to be afraid of a new thing, but this thing does seem to be a better version of the old one. So there you can see I've mirrored the negative emotion, talked about a vent that moved us to a new solution, and then talked about how I'm engaging with the new solution as well. Now, through all this, your wonderful diverse team and your imagination and your disaster recovery and all these things are gonna to come together and hopefully you will start to have some actual options on how to move forward. Do we continue working in a purely virtual fashion? Do we open up our business but at 25% capacity? And you will need to make a decision. It can be difficult when we don't know that there's a definitive right or wrong answer. So what I'm gonna share with you is some quick thoughts on decisions. In any situation, you will find yourself battling between two opposing elements. On the one side, this idea of stop and think, analyze, 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 check your facts. On the other side, there can be paralysis through analysis. So to help here, I'm gonna share with you a great quote from General Eisenhower, who of course then came, went on to become President Eisenhower. I'm not gonna do an American accent, it will just embarrass all of us. The best decision is the right decision. The second best decision is the wrong decision. The worst decision is no decision. So do not be afraid to make a decision. And if you find out later it's the wrong decision, then don't rigorously stick to it, own it. Be honest, look at how you're going to pivot from that fail and then improve. Don't be afraid to make a decision because sometimes that's one of the most important things. Amanda, thank you for, um, uh, lovely, a couple of comments there. I'm just gonna read them out, I think this is good. Um, Actually, we're business operations consultants, that's not approach at all, lovely. We empathize, but then talk about how this change will benefit the team, their jobs, their company. We're here to support you in this transition. We empathize, but then talk about how this change will benefit the team. Yeah, lovely, excellent, Amanda. So it's about showing that empathy first, then talking about the positive, and then still going back to that empathy as well. Thank you, Amanda, thank you. I work with an awful lot of business change consultants and so much of it is psychology. It isn't the Cotter's Eight Steps framework or something, although that stuff is great. It's about understanding how to communicate, how to tell that story. Amanda, I hope you will be on our next one next Tuesday when we're looking at leading change. And I'll invite any comments from you as we go through as well on that one, because uh, the more ideas, the better. Excellent, lovely. So, what we've covered through so far are some of our instant frameworks and also how to turn this into a positive. There's one more big piece that I want to look at, and that's looking at empowering and delegating tasks out to your people. And to do that, I'm gonna use a really old traditional model. If you've ever been on a management training course, you would have seen this, I'm sure. Let's have a look at good old traditional 
smarter objectives. Now, I love that the E and the R change across cultures. They change across industries. Here are the ones that I like playing with. Whenever we give a task or objective to someone, we should make sure it's specific, that it has a key measure, it's achievable, there is a relevance to them, we have clear timeframes, the task itself and the way we do it is engaging, and finally, we give them recognition at the end. Let's explore this in a little bit more detail, because I also personally think this is one of the most mistaught systems in management training as well. Now, it starts easy enough. The specific, what precisely needs to be done? In your situation room, you may find that you're sending out five different people with a big list of tasks. That's great. Make sure you are clear on what needs to be done. But this is how you get it clear. And this is the bit that most people miss. It's all about the measure, the measure of success. When we explain that, we explain why something needs to be done. I'll just share with you uh, a story that I have from my leadership training career. Uh, I was running a, a leadership course um, for reasonably small companies. There was an individual who ran a, an IT consultancy, only had about 30 people working for it. They'd had some really successful years and finally the husband and wife founders felt they were able to go on a holiday. It's the first time that they were leaving their company without their direct control. The instruction that the CEO gave to their people was this. I would like you to uh, get some flowers or something, but send some really nice gifts out to our clients to say thank you. The couple went away on holiday. They were determined to turn their phones off. They knew they would be contacted in an emergency and they didn't want to micromanage and be autocrats. So while they were on the beach in Barbados, they were saying, let's not worry about the company, let it go. Our people are great. They'll look after everything. When they got back, the CEO asked, did you manage to send gifts out to our clients? And here was the response. We did, boss. And we think you're going to be really happy with this. We know you wanted flowers. You mentioned flowers. We went to Lidl, which, by the way, if you're not familiar with Lidl, is a wonderful supermarket, but also often recognized as a budget supermarket. I shop at Lidl, by the way, so uh, there's no shame there. But it has a reputation as a budget supermarket. We went to Lidl and we found some really great bunches of flowers, really, really cheap. The staff thought they were doing a great thing by managing costs and expenditure. But what was the CEO trying to do here? Was trying to impress clients and he was trying to say we really really appreciate your business he hit the roof by the way he got really really angry and in the leadership program we covered this and we looked at how his leadership actions had been completely wrong what he hadn't done was share the measure of success the measure of success in this particular situation would be that the clients felt that the thank you was a genuine thing this wasn't about sending flowers. This was about sending something that was individual to each client, sending something that showed that the supplier company actually, excuse my language, but actually gave a damn about them as a client. When you share the measure of success, how success will be measured, you automatically share the why something is happening. And if you've already seen Smarter Objectives a hundred times, and again, I'm sure many of you have, please let this be the takeaway. That measure point is probably the single most important. Okay, let's move on and have a quick look at the other elements. We're not going to go into quite so much detail as we did with the measure. Make sure that what needs to be done is realistically achievable. Again, when I'm teaching leadership seminars, I sometimes give a little example and say, okay, everyone, I'm going to give you two years to do a one year's masters in psychology because i think all leaders should have an understanding of psychology is that achievable invariably these high performing people on my courses will put their hands up and say yes nick i will then say though by the way to do a master's degree on a part-time basis over a year will take you about 20 hours per week in the uk i suspect it's similar in places such as south africa and the us i don't know that but i suspect i want you to think about how busy you are at work I want you to think about how busy you are at home. Is it achievable? 
So make sure these things are realistically achievable as well. Whenever we're giving an objective to someone, they should understand why they were picked, why they're special, why it's important that they do this. This helps build engagement. Of course, we should make sure we have clear time frames as well. And thank you for the comment, Faye. I really like that. The E and the R are so key in this framework. Many companies miss the last two off and they are so important. They are absolutely engaging and recognition. Anytime you give a task, try and suit it to the personality you're giving it to and try and build engagement. My quickest tip on this is either explain how the individual will benefit from doing the work, or if you've been on a good leadership course and you understand coaching methodologies, ask them how they will benefit from doing this. Remember, the single most powerful influencing tool we have is to ask, not tell. And finally, make sure that you give that recognition, 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 because if you don't, you kill engagement after. Amanda, thanks for your comment. Well, his reaction is a direct reflection of his leadership. Yes, you are absolutely right. I can tell you he's a wonderful guy. And at the end of the leadership program, by the way, he went back and he actually apologized to all of his staff and talked about what he'd learned and how he'd improve in the future as well. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right, Amanda. Amanda, it's a pleasure having you on board. Kuldip says, totally agree with recognition. It's not always about high salaries. No, uh, and again, without going into too many other courses, uh, you might want to have a look at Herzberg's hygiene factors. In this, the wonderful psychologist Herzberg explores how bonuses and salaries only motivate people for a short period of time. Genuine thank yous and recognition, they motivate people for six months. Uh, now, that's an entire other course in our leadership uh, directory, but yeah, you're absolutely right, Kuldip. Absolutely right. Okay, that's a very, very quick thought about, uh, yeah, absolutely, David. That's a very, very quick thought about giving those tasks to people in a situation room. Just remember, whenever we are uh, in this kind of situation, this is an opportunity to grow people. Uh, about 15 years ago, I used to teach that management was about achieving tasks through people. But I stopped that about 15 years ago and it evolved into leadership is about developing people through tasks. One is a reactive measure. The other is a proactive measure that grows your people, therefore grows your resources, therefore grows your bottom line and enables you to go home for tea. So just remember, whenever you're giving a task, the purpose is to grow the person, not to break them. And that, ladies and gentlemen, after 54 minutes, brings us pretty much to the end of the core content of this session. So let's do a quick review of what we've covered, and then with a few minutes remaining, I'll just open up to more questions, because you guys have been a really active group. It's lovely to uh, have so much interaction. What we have covered today First of all, stopping thinking and acting and why that was so difficult. That whole idea that actually in a crisis we can panic and then we just react and we have a knee-jerk reaction. It's the wrong thing to do. Stop, think, then act. We've looked at the leadership traits for crisis management and you already knew this. But sometimes it's really valuable just to stop, pause and shine a brilliant spotlight on what you already knew as well. We then played, and this was the main bulk of what we did, we looked at some wonderful models that were originally created not by myself or ILX, but by the Brookings Institute. These models for, first of all, how to respond to a crisis, and then also how to turn a crisis into an opportunity. And I can tell you in our leadership programs and management programs, we go into a lot more depth of those, including things like systems thinking. And finally, we've looked at how we can empower others, set clear expectations and objectives, and we've used a lovely old traditional model, smarter objectives, but perhaps maybe you've seen that in a slightly new light. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we still have five minutes spare, and in the time of uh, 
not too much spare time. I think that's quite a nice thing. So I'm going to say that we've reached the end of our WebEx. Feel free to log off now if you want to. The um, video will be made available on the ILX YouTube channel in a couple of days. However, I'm not going anywhere. You are clearly a nice active bunch. So I'm going to read out a couple more comments. Thank you, Mada. Read out a couple more comments. And if you have more questions, fire them away. If I can't answer them, you're probably just going to intrigue me with your question anyway. So uh, David's mentioned about hygiene factors again. Catherine says, I think smarter goals make them easier to tackle and evaluate. And we address your approach. Yeah, absolutely. And a couple of nice mentions as well there as well. So thank you for all your lovely comments. That's all good. So anyone, any questions, anything, any burning issues that you'd like to put into the question box? I absolutely uh, I'm happy to jump into these. Have you got an example of when crisis management worked well? Yeah, loads, uh, loads of examples. Probably some of the best examples come from military situations and people like NASA. Um, the, interestingly, the best crisis models come from when there has been a really bad crisis and people learn from it. For example, uh, yeah, comment when flying a plane, panic, you die. Bit scary, but true. For example, I don't know how many people realize this, but the World Health Organization reacted to Ebola and the National Institute of Health, et cetera, reacted to Ebola by setting up an early warning system. That is what picked up, as far as we're aware, that is what picked up COVID-19. If the lessons learned from crisis management hadn't been in place, we probably wouldn't be looking at a death toll of near quarter of a million at the moment. We would probably be looking at a death toll of millions already. Now, I need to be careful. I'm not stating that as a fact. Again, I'm not a biologist or virologist, but yes, absolutely. Uh, again, the stuff that the Brookings Institute has done, I mean, I've given them a lot of credit for this. I don't know that they came up with it. What they did was look at the military and medical establishments and look at what was working there. I can tell you right now, uh, the current crisis management around the world is really, really different. And we're seeing different countries implementing good crisis management. And some, and I'm not going to mention names because I don't believe in being deeply negative about people, some really are not doing that either. Uh, Jan has said, I do have a question, Nick. How would you handle a situation where there is a continued resistance for your response to the crisis? For example, many companies are embarking on cost-cutting exercises, including retrenching staff. This is not a popular route to follow, but needs to be done. What do you recommend? Um, I recommend influencing skills. Absolutely. So, okay, everyone, I'm now going to jump back quite a few slides. So my apologies here, but I'm going to jump back to our story. So, the story that you see on the right hand side, um, if I'm going to rephrase this, on Friday I'm doing a WebEx for just eight data scientists and their issue is how do we get our company to make data driven decisions instead of emotional decisions and what I'm going to be showing them is how facts and figures rarely change minds. Instead we need an understanding of things like choice architecture. So I'll give you a couple of quick pointers here. By all means, um, contact us at ILX. You know, we are very happy to do more business with you and provide you with more training. What you can also do, go buy a book called Nudge by Sunstein and Taylor. In this, you'll be introduced to an idea called choice architecture. It's how we can start to influence people in their decisions without enforcing decisions on them. And for the academics amongst you, I'd recommend not just Nudge, but the holy grail of this stuff, Daniel Kahneman's work on decision theory. This guy won a Nobel Prize in economics for showing that actually us humans do not make rational economic decisions. We make emotional led decisions. Uh, this is one of my specialist subjects. I love talking about this, so I need to be careful not just to go into a full rant, but there's two jumping off points for you. By all means, contact your account manager, ILX, definitely, and we can sort something out for you. But also, you can go buy these books and distill an awful lot of the knowledge. And one of the things we love doing at ILX, I really love doing, sharing knowledge, sharing knowledge, sharing knowledge. A uh, couple of other questions as well here. So again, I can see that some people are logging off. That's great. You go for it. Officially, we are at the end, but I'm going to keep going because I love doing this. 
How easy is it to handle the pressure from a boss who does not have a clear view about a problem because of his stress and in the same time to take the best decision which might be the complete opposite from your boss's opinion? Well, well first of all, to answer your question, Tesos, yes, it's difficult um, and I would, just as a first intro, go back to our first ILX virtual session which is available on YouTube on um, managing stress. Um, dealing, uh, managing resilience and boosting that up and in that you're going to see some things around looking at when you are in a stress situation because the situation you're describing there is a really stressful one. In that we look at recognizing your stress, responding to it by getting yourself into a clear place of thinking and then resolving and of course it's the resolving element that then leads us back into okay how do I influence my boss? And I'd, I'd be almost willing to make a financial bet on this, Tezos. If, if you go in hard and aggressive and simply disagree with your boss, you're probably going to be the one that comes off worse because that's how hierarchies work. If you use a technique like the one that's on the screen at the moment, mirror, describe the event that helped change your view and move to the next event and then just walk away maybe you'll be dropping a seed into your boss's head that might help them engage with that new way of thinking and the idea that is not natural to them. What we generally find is when there's an extreme conflict situation going on, uh, it's not about my idea is better than yours, it's about, well, tell me more about your idea, let me empathize with it, and then moving that person, taking them on a journey with you towards the hopefully better idea as well. Not the most full answer I could give Tosos because again I mean this is a big subject but hopefully that will give you a couple of quick thoughts as well and again you probably want to link in on our next session of leading change because really what we're going to be talking about influencing people. That's what we're really talking about with leading change is how to influence people in an ethical and positive manner. Thank you for the comment Nicola, much appreciated. Um, great Rosemary says, how to persuade a disinterested manager that this crisis is a good time to focus on team building? Uh, that was my question, he just answered it. Lovely, excellent. I'm, I'm pleased we managed to answer it. So again, I know that that's not an absolute complete answer, but hopefully it gives you some ideas. Don't go to war with people, understand them instead. Uh, I have an, a saying that I use an awful lot in my leadership training, which is for every human behavior, there's a reason understand the reason you can start to influence the behavior if you just ignore the reason and say the other person is stupid you're probably unlikely to actually influence them at all similarly your response on the previous questions was about influencing bosses covers this yeah absolutely Jay. i'm pleased that that was useful for you as well great so again uh, we're five minutes past our finish time i'm still happy to carry on i've got no issue with this at all in the slightest you can see more people logging off I'm going to browse up and see if we have any other questions that were popped up there. Thank you, Jan. Much appreciated. <laughs> You're being too kind there. Masterclass and how a webinar should be conducted. What? Well, make sure you have your Labrador in the room and you have to interrupt yourself when he's in the middle of a dream. Poor little boy. Bless him as well. But thank you. I really appreciate that. It's very kind. Very kind. Uh, so I'm going to scroll up and have a look for more questions before we say goodbye. How would you weave gold, silver, bronze roles into the approaches discussed? Uh, John, can you elaborate on that? So gold, silver and bronze immediately starts making me think about different project management strategies. Uh, where do you approach that? Do you mean like a best standard and world-class approach and a not so good approach? So John, if you're still on, feel free to add in some more thoughts to that and I will try and answer your question more fully. Scanning down, scanning down for more questions. Oh, John, you've got me really curious now. I want to know a little bit further about what you were referring to there. So again, my instant thought is that we're talking about the standards of project management, um, but I, I shouldn't make an assumption there. Cool, as Jan's colleague, I can only agree. Thanks a lot, excellent stuff, excellent stuff. Okay, I can see a lot of people are starting to log off now, which is probably a completely natural time. So once again, I invite you to log off if you need to get back to doing something. If you're in a different time zone and you've woken up early for this or you're working late for this, um, 
However, I won't be logging off until we're down to about our last five or 10 people or so. And I am gonna go on mute for a second. Uh, lovely. Thanks, John, much appreciated. Oh, and a quick comment from Chloe as well. So let me go up to John. How to deliver remote support in an emergency. Yeah, it's interesting one. So it's about recognizing what can be done and what can't be done. What can be done and what can't be done as well. So, uh, as you know, when you're implementing a new system, often you're going to put it into, say, emergency care provisions. We're going to up the resources where we can. Another way of doing this as well when you're implementing a new system is to talk about what support is available and what support isn't available and making this really, really clear. So, in a crisis, we can use those same kind of approaches that we might use for implementing a new IT system, almost any project implementation as well. So, think about your gold, silver, bronze. Think about what can be done and what can't be done. What is to use some lean terminology and value proposition terminology? What is the customer value proposition and what they really want with all the bells and whistles on? And what's actually the minimum viable stuff that needs to be done. Um, as working with a German asset management client recently, who were worrying about their technology, and I said, look, you don't have the bandwidth at the moment embedded in order to be able to deal with all the video and capability, but you know what, you don't need that. What you need to be able to make sure people can do is just talk to people online. That's our basic, that is our bare bones, that is our minimum, viable proposition. Once you've got that in place, then you can move forward as well. Um, quick comment from Chloe there. Thanks for your time, Nick. Thanks for ILX. Great. Yep, absolutely. We've recently been promoted to a project manager role, which I obviously knew to. I would have the opportunity to complete training with you guys, but for obvious reasons, all training has been halted. Well, a lot of the training is happening virtually as well. So hopefully, Chloe, feel free to reach out to your account manager. I'm sure there's a way that we can help you there. Thanks, Nick. Very insightful. Brilliant. Mish, thank you. Oh, you are a really lovely bunch of people. See, one of the things that I love about doing this job, I'm going to share a very personal view, but hey, there's only 45 of us on now, is the end of each day when I get home, uh, well, I'm currently at home all the time, but generally speaking, my little girl who's seven says, Daddy, who did you help and what were their problems? So doing, I love doing this job because it makes you feel really really good when you have a positive impact on other people's lives when you share knowledge when you make things easier for them being a trainer is great being a business psychologist is great okay now that was a bit of a slushy end so probably and it looks like most of these are now just <laughs> bad luck adele i'm sorry about that <laughs> um then probably now is a good time for us to end this session for most of you I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday when we're going to be looking at leading change. So once again, I'm going to go on mute and just browse all these lovely comments while I sip coffee. Any other final questions? Happy to answer them. Other than that, thanks everyone.